fearful time had come for one little Hebrew boy who was his father's firstborn son. Now with the angel of death passing low, it was hard to fall asleep. But one little lamb stood in his mind as he lay there counting sheep. He wondered why the young lamb had to die, why his blood was on the door. Through the wind and rain it still remained, but he wanted so scared, crying, Father, will you please look and see if the blood is still there? He said, Son, now don't you worry, for the blood is there to stay. The wind may blow, the rain may fall, but it won't just wash away. the blood is still there. Looking over the damage Satan's storm had left behind, the flood of endless questions, doubt had filled my mind. The fear that gripped my troubled soul brought me back to my knees in prayer, crying, Father, will you please look and see if the blood is still there? He said, Son, now don't you worry, for the blood is there to stay. wash away the blood will stand the raging storm has been applied with loving care safe secured you can rest assured that the blood is still there safe secured you can rest assured that the blood
across hell safely the waves dash high for Jesus will be at my side he'll steal the rough waters when by and by I'm crossing the river so I walked the sinful road Oh, so heavy was the load Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now He lifted me from the miry clay Placed me on the righteous way Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now He forgave me when he saved me Place my feet on solid ground. He's my keeper, my keeper. and my guide. my guide. And every day he's walking right by my side. When I need a helping hand, on oh, my Savior I can depend. Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now. Now I walk this glory road. Since the Savior bore my load Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now Soon I'll lay these old burdens down And receive a robe and crown Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now He forgave me when he saved me Place my feet on solid ground He's my keeper, my keeper and my guide. my guide And every day he's walking right by my side When I need a helping hand On oh, my Savior I can depend Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now Hallelujah, I'm walking on the right road now. Amen. Thank you there, Brother Rick. All right, get your Bibles. We're going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 
5, verse 17, will be our theme verse, our study verse for a little while. Hope the Lord will use this to be great help to us. Christianity, new creatures in Christ Jesus. Bible says in verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now this morning we established the fact that Christians are those that rest in the finished work of Calvary, rely on the atoning blood of Christ, and are the recipients of the regenerating work of the Holy Ghost. I made a closing comment that Dr. Adrian Rogers said that Christianity, a new creature, means you're under new management, and that's good. That is a good thing, a good way of looking at it. I thought about Christianity, and, and you know, they were labeled first Christians there at Antioch, and they was labeled that because they were Christ-like. And uh, I thought about that a little bit. I thought, you know, that means that we ought to be Christians. We ought to be Christ-like most of the time. No, that ain't good enough, is it? Should be all the time, shouldn't it? Amen. So God help us to live the life with the power and the help of Christ working in us. We're going to deal with that a little bit here in a minute. Uh, to make us uh, what we should be and able, enable us to live a Christ-like life. We ought to be that way. They ought to be in a resemblance. Just as a son or daughter is to the father or mother, they ought to be some resemblance of our Heavenly Father in our lives because we are children of God. Amen. Well, I want to deal with a couple things tonight in this new creature. In Christ Jesus, I want to look at a few things about this. When you think about the Christian walk, you think about Christianity, you think about a person that has given their life to the Lord. Literally, that's what we did, right? I mean, I didn't, I didn't just ask him, just save me from hell and let me go. God dealt with me. I wanted to be, I wanted to be a Christian. I wanted to be like Christ. I wanted to not sin. I didn't want to go to hell for sure. I did want to go to heaven. But I wanted to be like Jesus. I'd heard enough of the Word of God as a young man to, or a young boy to know that, that that's the right way things should be. I wanted to be that kind of guy. I felt dirty and guilty and filthy and rotten because I was a sinner. And I didn't want that. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a Christian. I wanted to, I wanted to be like folks that live the life of a Christian, true Christians. I've been around folks in the years that, that uh, have lived what would be a true Christian life. The word Christian brings out a word of a consecrated person. When you think about consecration, you're talking about someone that has given themselves, dedicated themselves, set themselves apart to be this. Ball players, they consecrate themselves to that ball. They, they, they consecrate themselves to that game. They, they, Tom Brady is probably one of the greatest, and I know some folks don't like him, but as far as contributing and, and consecrating himself to the game, he has probably done that better than anybody else, regardless of his wins or losses. Physical status, he has consecrated himself. They, they talk about the different things that he won't even think about eating because he wanted his body so preserved and so in shape that he would be enabled to play the ball game and played to, what, 43, 44 years old, something? That's phenomenal to play football that many years. And, and, and to think about someone that is consecrated to that, to being the best that they absolutely can be for that particular cause. Well, Christians are folks that are to be consecrated to the cause of Christ, meaning that we should be, we should be living, thinking, drinking, sleeping, dreaming, everything about trying to be the best we can for Christ. Consecrated, set apart. For that particular use, God help us to be that type of a Christian. Well, when you think of consecration, one of the things that comes to mind in consecration is to be consistent in it. That means it's something that you do on a regular basis. Consistency, consistency. Well, Christianity deals with consistency. We're to be faithful. We don't have a church covenant hanging, but church covenant 
uh, that most churches have or go by or use as a guideline speaks of folks being faithful to the house of God, being consistent to the house of God. There, there's standards that must be met for folks that are to hold offices or do things. I mean, what if I showed up every once in a while on Sunday? Just, you know, if I decided I didn't want to go fishing this Sunday, I show up. If I, if I decide I'm going fishing, I go fishing. What if I decide, uh, hey, man, I think I'll just go to the ball game or I want to go do this. What if I was inconsistent in the position I hold as other folks are as being church members? Consistency, church attendance. There's a many of pastors, leaders, church-loving folks that are grieved over the lack of attendance and consistency in attendance of many church folk. When you consider that a pastor has gone to God, spent time in prayer to get the message that God wants him to deliver to his people, what do you need today? I have to seek God, beg, pray, plead, study, agonize to find what God knows we need today for this particular service and then you show up thinking that God's going to help this family or that family and he only finds out that they decided that this was a day that they was going to take family day. They're going to go do this with the family. They're going to go do that with the family and y'all know me, I'm all about you doing with your family. But I wonder why does it always have to take Sunday? Why couldn't it took Saturday? Why, why, why couldn't you make Saturday your family day? Why couldn't you make Saturday the day you was going to go do this or the day you was going to go do that? Come on now. See, we have come to the place that church is the less, most least important thing in our life. I ask you, how important is church to you? Now, I've got the choir sitting here tonight. I understand that, but there's a whole bunch of folks looking in from all over the world. So to anybody and everybody, Church attendance. How important is church attendance to you? If it's not very important to you, then it'll be of no importance to your children. And your grandkids probably won't even dart the doors. What you put weight and value on, your children will put weight and value on. I've noticed this in dealing with families through the years and when some dear loved one goes on to be with the Lord, there might be a certain something that that, that that person that went to be with the Lord really cherished or, or really thought much of. And that particular thing, item, adventure, activity becomes very important to the family because it was important to them. You know, we ought to be living a life that people know that the most important thing to us is Jesus Christ. As Christians, we ought to be living a life that people know that the most important thing to our life is Christ. And Christ loved the church so much that he gave himself for it. Your family ought to know that you love church more than anything else in the world. You'd be foolish not to know that I love Miss Judy. I, I make much of that. You know that. We, we cut up. We have a good time. We enjoy marriage. I'm 35 years married. Come March, I'm happily married. I don't tell her that because I'm still working on some things. but it's because it's we have made much of it. It's important to us. But she knows that church comes first. Amen. Many a times we've not done certain things or been able to go and do because we put church first. Church is that important to me. We're planning to take a little time here next month, but I'm planning on being here on church day. Fully planning on being here on church day. I'll miss Wednesday probably, but I'll be in church somewhere. But I'll probably not be here uh, Wednesday, but I'll be here Sunday because it's important to me. The reason it's important is I know that's where I get fed. That's where I get help. That's where I get encouragement. And it's a requirement of my father to be here at church. Wow, preacher, you're just a little fanatical on it. Really? You got a job? How many days a year they let you miss before they'll fire you? Hello? Let's talk about real world now. 
Somebody tell me, how many days can you miss before you get fired at your job? Anybody got a number? You know how many you can miss? Rick, you know what you can miss at Pratt? You don't ever miss none, but I mean, do you have any idea? Used to be four or five days is all you get and you're gone. I don't know what it is now. But I mean, you, your boss man, your boss man depends on you showing up in the morning. And if you decide to go fishing, you tell him you decide to go fishing. Don't lie and say, oh, sick. <laughs> well, I was sick. I was sick of work. I just wanted to go fishing. But the, the truth of it is, you, you know. But see, when you think about these matters, I mean, when you think about anything that you're part of, whether it be a club, whether it be a team, your employment, any kind of group thing that you join up with, if you're not faithful to it after a certain amount of time, they're going to put you out. Amen. But now at church, we're supposed to not worry about that. You know how liberal churches are on this matter? Most churches will give you a full year of not even being in the house before they'll dismiss you from a row. That's most churches. I think that's over liberal. Now I'm not about kicking people off the off the membership board. Don't go don't go acting silly on me. But I mean, really, when you think about it, they ain't been there in a whole year. But you're to retain that membership. See how important? How important? You answer this to your own heart. How really important is church to you? It's the place that we come together to worship God. By the way, it's the place God said to come to worship Him. Well, I can worship the Lord out there in my truck. I can worship the Lord down there in the field. I can worship the Lord at the house. You sure can. But God also said if you'd be at the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. He said not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. We know the day's approaching, so we all be doing more. Amen? Amen. 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 We understand pandemic. We've dealt with it. We're back in. We was out for the month of January because we were trying to preserve the lives of our family, church family. I know a dear brother of mine up in the mountains right now that had to call it off today because the sickness has broke out in his place. He's doing it to take care of his sheep, and I agree. Got to do what you need to do in that respect. We're not laying out of church. We're not going fishing, shopping, hunting. We're not, we're not missing it for some other kind of carnal activity, we're, to, we're missing the actual fellowship at the house of God because of a sickness that could kill people. Pretty good wise choice, I think. We, we, we come to church for the purpose of testifying of His grace. This is, this is a place that's set aside. I can come in here and just tell you how good God's been to me and I ain't got to worry about it. You're not judging me. You're not going to be critical, right? You're not going to have any funny feelings against me because I want to stand up and say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. That's what church, church is a place for worship and praise, testifying of the goodness and the grace of Almighty God in our lives. It's a place to sing his praises. Brother Rick just got done. It helps our hearts to rejoice. It sets our hearts in a worship mode and a receiving mode for the message tenderizes us, gets our mind back in focus on what really matters in life. Hey, man, you come in here, you'll be singing all kind of melodies. Hello. Been listening to stuff coming down the highway. Some jingle was on the TV right before you left. That'll be all up in your mind. You get in here, good song, good songs about the Lord, and, and, and that'll get your mind focused on Him, and you'll get to worshiping and loving on Him. You'll want to testify of His goodness and His grace, and you'll want to sing His praises. I, I, I will never, God help me to never get over it. My little old grandma loved to sing. She said, I can't sing good. My old throat's all raspy and stuff. My voice is raspy, but I just love singing. You know what? There wasn't a bit of problem with that at her house. They didn't nobody criticize her. They didn't nobody look down on her. They didn't nobody say, hey, you missed that note. We sang at Grandma's house as much as she wanted to. 
and God likes it. I can tell you he likes it. He show up. Amen. She get happy in Jesus there singing. Amen. With just her and the grand youngins. And y'all thought all we done was played games up there. Ha ha. We had a good time with Jesus, I'm telling you. She kept them old hymnals around there. We'd sing out of them some. But you know, now y'all can't tell him I said this. Preacher Joe can't sing a lick. He don't even know how to spell tune. Okay? With a five-gallon bucket, he can't spell it. In the shower, anywhere, he can't. He can't. But you know, deep down, he likes to sing. He, he, he likes that singing. It does something in his spirit. It does an uplifting and an encouragement. He likes good old-fashioned God-given singing. Amen? That's what church is about. Amen. Church. But we also come for the purpose of hearing this message. So I guess when folks lay out, choose not to attend, other things become more important, they don't need a message from God that week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to talk or hear from the Lord this week, huh? Hello. See, church is about us singing praises to him, worshiping him, giving thanks of his grace to others. I mean, it's, it's, it's and receiving the message. God has designed this thing of the preacher. He says he chose the foolishness of the preacher and saved those which is lost. And God has set up this thing about preaching. And, and all through the epistles, they exhort the preacher to preach. Paul said, be instant in season, out of season. That means preach when there ain't nobody caring. Preach when there ain't nobody showing up. Preach when it ain't going easy. And preach when it all goes just as smooth and heaven comes down. See, you got to preach in season, out of season. Sometimes it's tough, sometimes it ain't. I'll be honest with you, it's tough this morning. Amen. The devil was fighting all the way this morning. But I'm thankful that I've got a Savior that has more power and more grace to help us get through. Amen. Amen. Consistency in our attendance. Can I say this? The altar of inconsistency has robbed Almighty God of some great servants. Inconsistency has crippled many churches. How much effort have you put into developing yourself for the work of God? Well, you, see, preacher, you don't know. See, I, 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 was, I was trying to do work for God, and this, this here happened back years ago, and you know, I just, I, I just, I just, I just, I just can't. Why? God put you on shelf or you're cast away? Hmm. Don't think so, huh? Well, why ain't you developing yourself to be all you can be for the glory of God? You might not be a vase that he could use. He may have mass you back down and make you a plate to serve, but God's still got things you can do for him. Amen. I'll never, I hope God never lets me get over Seeing that potter, when he had that, they sung that song this morning. Seeing that potter, he made this big old pretty vase. Man, that thing was shaped up, going to be pretty to be on display. Hold them beautiful bouquet of flowers and things and had that thing fixed up. And he said, hmm, wait a minute. He stopped that wheel, took out that little old bitty, little old bitty pointed pin knife. And he reached in there, the little old spot. Spot was so small you couldn't hardly see it, but he saw it. And he got to picking at that spot. He said, I got a flaw right here. There's a place in that clay that didn't smooth out and develop like it was supposed to. It had hardened. It had a hardened spot in it. He got to picking at that. When he got done, honey, I'm telling you, there's a great big old hole. And I watched that potter take his hand and just, and that vase went, and he began to work it again, and he made a plate. He said, see, that vase couldn't be set on display to be pretty and show off and be a glorified thing to the master that made it. But the master seen it better fit to be a server as a plate to serve others. Now let me ask you a question. wonder who got more usage. That pretty vase that could have been sitting on there just to look at or that plate was there to serve everybody. 
I'll tell you what I'd do. I'll take the plate. God, let me be a plate. Mold me and make me into what I can be. What's God using you for? What have you, what have you been called to do for the Lord? I ain't talking about just preaching. Preaching ain't the only callings, folks. There's a lot more God can use you for if you'll let God use you and develop you. Study to show thyself approve ain't just a thing for preachers, I don't think. We need to be consistent in our attendance. Let God develop us into what we should be. We need to be consistent in our character. Now, in these days, most folks don't know much about what character is. Character is who you are. That's the makeup. That's who you are in the dark or in the light. That's, that's, that's that person that has honesty and integrity. That, that, that's, the, that's the real governing factor inside of a person. You know, the old, the old timers would teach us, as they, as they taught us and raised us up, they'd teach us a man of his word is a man of his word, and a man that don't have a word is not the man that can be trusted or used. Whatever you do, keep your word. If something comes up you can't keep your word, you go to them and tell them why you can't and make it right. You tell somebody you're going to do something, get it done. You stay after it. You be honest. You be, you be a man of integrity. Character, character development is something that we need teaching to our young folks. So they learn that, hey, it's right to be honest. It's right to have integrity. It's right to do what you say you're going to do. But we've got folks today that are so come and go. I mean, you don't ever know what they're going to do. You know, you've heard, you've heard folk, folks make statements about someone. They'll say, well, you never know what they'll do. They say, well, they're this way today and another way tomorrow. You know, that's, that's one of them people. Hey, well, you just... I hate to say it, you just can't count on them. You don't know what they're going to do. Well, they'll be here, well, they won't be here. You know, that's a shame for a Christian. It should be a shame for a Christian. It is a shame. You ought to be able to be counted on. Like I said about the attendance part, you ought to have some character about you. You ought to be, you ought to be a person that somebody can count on you. Amen. You ought to be the type of person that the Lord can say, Hey, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant... See, Job was a man of integrity. Job was a man of great character. God said, hey, now listen to me. Job was not Superman. He didn't have no extra special something or another. He was just a man that had great character. And God said, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Now, we know Job's got some flaws about him. We've read the book. Job ain't perfect in everything about his life. Now, the Lord said he was perfect, which means he was fully matured. And he did take the task and complete the task with the glory of God. In the end, you know, God gave him back double what he had before. So Job passed the test. Wonder, wonder in our crowd who God could say, Hey, have you considered... Do we have that kind of character about us? God help us, folks. We should. Because we're not that old person that's lost and mean and ugly and on the way to the devil's hell. We're a new creature in Christ Jesus. We've got a new character about us. Amen. New creatures in Christ Jesus. Amen. Character. There's many folks that will have good intentions. They'll start things and fail to complete them. That's not good character. We, we need to be people of character that will start it and finish the job. It, it's, a, it's a bad thing. And, and for young folks, it, it, you moms, dads, grandpa, grandpa, grandmas, you see children that, that'll start things and not finish. You need to go back and teach them to finish the job. They need to learn early that when they start something, they finish it. Don't leave the task undone because later on in life they'll start stuff and never finish it. That's not good character. You want, you want folks to complete the task. I mean, you know, good night. If I, was to, if I was to say, hey, Corey, I need you to take the trash out. 
This one up here is full. You need to get it. If I tell him to do that, he'd come up here and get it, and he walked back halfway through the best view and stopped and talked to somebody, set it down, and then next week, there it sits. That's not good. Somebody else has got to finish his job. That's not good character. That's not good integrity. Amen. Y'all all right? Everybody with me? We need, we need to have folks that will take on a task and finish, complete that task. Amen. Amen. That's good Christianity. That's the difference between the lost world that don't care about anything and we that do. See, when you finish a job, it shows you cared about the job. You care about completing it and making it the very best you could. Amen? Amen. So be consistent in our character. Be consistent in our attendance. Be consistent in our charity. See, one of the most outstanding characteristics, attributes, of a Christian is that matter of charity. Now, you know what the word charity means. Preacher Joe said it years ago, and I picked up on what he said, and what I found out, everybody else believes about the same way. The word charity just simply means love in action. Charity is, is following through. In a general sense, it means love, uh, benevolence, goodwill, that disposition of the heart that in, inclines men to think favorably of their fellow men and to do them good. Notice that it didn't just say that he thinks favorably, but to do them good. Put a little action to your love. In the theological sense, it includes the supreme love of God and universal goodwill to men. You go to go to 1 Corinthians with me, if you will, there a minute. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sound in brass and a tinkling cymbal. No words will make noise, no do no good. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. You see what Paul's saying? If I had the greatest of faith and could move, literally move mountains, but yet I don't have charity, which is love in action, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Paul said the most important thing about the Christian life is to have charity. Charity suffereth long. Charity is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, and is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understand as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Paul saying to us about this new creature, one of the things that outstanding attributes or characteristics, one of the outstanding things about their life is that of charity. Charity. Charity, charity is love for others. Jesus said that first of all, first of all the commandments is, Hear, the, hear O Israel, the Lord God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And this is the first commandment. The second is likely, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the Lord is saying to us, there's two great commandments that I want you to get a hold of. First and foremost, love God. Secondly, love others. That's not a, if you want to. Re you remember what he said? It's a command that we love others. God help us in a self-first society that we live in. Most folks in the days that we live put self first. 
what I want, what I need, what I feel, what I desire, what I hurt is first. And that is so damaging to our peoples because selfishness is so wrong. Particularly when it's labeled with somebody that calls themselves a Christian. Because Christ likeness is others first. You remember the acrostic for joy? Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That's a hard thing for people to deal with. To put someone else's need in front of their need. That's tough stuff sometimes. To give with others or give to others before taking for yourself. That's some tough stuff to live by. But you know that's what Christians do. Christians are about others. It, it's, it's what's expected of Christianity is to put others first. Jesus said in John 13, 35 that uh, the, the disciples would be identified and their love one for another. He said, you said, they shall know you because you have love one for another. I asked you this morning, what would be the identifying factors? What would you, what would you say, hmm, that's a Christian. What is it that is outstanding on someone that would make you consider them to be a Christian? What identifying points, what characteristics in their life would make you think or believe that they are a Christian. Well, I've just given you two that should be the top of the list. One, they love the Lord thy God with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, with all their strength. That should be number one. Number two should be they love others. Outstanding thing in our life should be the love that we display and exercise for other people. Amen? That's the idea of a Christian according to Jesus. Amen? So we should, we should be consistent in our church attendance and our character and in our charity. We should be, and this is going to go right along where I was at, we should be considerate of others. When you think about Christianity, we should be considerate of others. We should consider one. We should consider our obligations. Now, don't nobody answer out loud, but I want you to think for a minute. It's, it's okay. It won't hurt you too bad, but I want you to think just a minute. What are your obligations to Christ. Now here's what I want you to do. I know it's ball game night and folks will be watching Super Bowl and all that, but I want you to take time either tonight or in the morning sometime. Sometime you get a chance, I want you to sit yourself down and look at and write down what you consider to be the obligations that you have to God. Need to know that. What is your obligations? Well, I hadn't thought about that, preacher. Well, you need to. Because you are obligated to the Lord. God's, God's given you some obligations in this life. See, he's told us there's things that we are to be about doing. And I, I want to remind you, God settled a verse in my heart many years ago in Luke chapter 12, verse number 48, and it, it, it really shook me to my bones. When you look at Luke chapter 12, verse 48, it says, Unto whom much is given, much shall be required. And we've got the full canon of scriptures in our hand. We know what God wants, we know what God likes, and we know what God desires of us. Right there. What's my obligations, preacher? Get in your Bible and let the Holy Ghost of God give you some leadership. He'll show you just exactly what your obligations are. Souls, souls is one of them, I tell you. Souls is one of them. We're supposed to be fishers of men. We're supposed to be sowing the seed. And you also got a church. Well, what's my obligation to the church? Get in your Bible, study. Learn what your obligations is. You, you got obligations. Yes, you got obligations. The Lord gives us directions through the scriptures on how we're to conduct our lives. I just gave you several of those things. One of them was about attendance. 
Think about these things. See, when you get around the church house, here, here's, a, here's a famous little thing that went around many years ago. There's an important job that had to be done. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry that because it was everybody's job, everybody thought anybody could do it. But nobody realized that anybody could have done it. Leaves it undone, don't it? There are a lot of, a lot of those things that the Lord would have us to do. We could do, we could be part of, we could help with. If we just take a few moments, get on our knees and say, Lord, please put in my heart. Put, give me the desire and, and the understanding to do what you have obligated for me to do. Wouldn't it be awful to stand before the Lord and the Lord have a whole list of things that you were supposed to be doing or should have done and you did not do that and you're going to stand there at the judgment seat of Christ? Matter of fact, go back and read the chapter that I've read to us where I'm pulling my text from. We're going to stand for the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to give an account before the judgment seat of Christ. We've got obligations. With those obligations, we've got opportunities. I could go through a various list tonight of opportunities. If you're saved by the good grace of God, somewhere, sometime in life, you've went by somebody that God impressed on your heart that you need to speak to or give a track to. But you had to get on in the building or you had to go ahead and do this and you just didn't really have the time to take care of that, but you're going to do it in a minute and when you go do what you thought you needed to do first, you come back and they're gone. Now, you may not admit it, but I'm going to admit it. I've been there, done that, and it hurt me. Grieved my soul. Sometimes God will work it out to where you'll get a second opportunity. But you don't know that. So we don't play for second opportunities. When God presents us with an opportunity, may God give us the grace, the grit to complete that opportunity. Maybe somebody you just need to hand a track to and say, look, Lord, put you on my heart. I just want to give you a little something to read about Jesus so you can know how to go to heaven. That may open a big door for you. and You may be able to witness to them, and that may be just the end of it. That may be all you get to do is pass them a track. But you have fulfilled the opportunity and the obligation that God has placed before you. It's important that we take care of these things. The book of Jude says, And some have compassion, making a difference, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire. I thought about this when I was studying last night, early morning. There's folks that I'm going to pass in life's way that I will have an opportunity, not just because you passed them down the highway, but I'll have an opportunity to witness to them or give them a gospel track. And I failed to do so. Here's what hit my heart. I'm just as well as to go ahead and give them that push towards hell. Because God Almighty gave me the opportunity. I have the obligation to give them a track or witness to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I failed to do so. And I'm guilty. Ezekiel 33 tells us that their blood be on my hands. My God in heaven, I hope somebody will witness to them because I failed so that blood ain't dripping from my hands when we get to heaven. But I wonder how many people through this life we have had that opportunity and we did not exercise it. May God help us. Many verses I could read on this matter, but I'm not going to spend the time. I'm going to close on this thought. Not only do we need to be considerate of others, Not only should we be consistent, but we also ought to be courageous. See, what I'm sharing with you tonight is God's Word. If you don't like it, you can go to God. I'm, I'm trying with the best I can to, to deliver the message, not with ill will, not with, a, not with a bold and an ugly, sarcastic attitude, but with a heart of love the message that God has laid in my heart for our people for this time. And it's God's message. Bottom line, it's God's message. 
I, I, I prayed and looked and studied and sought and done everything I know to do in the best of my ability. This is what God wants us. And even if I missed it, it's still God's word. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become anew. That's God's message. And I have the opportunity to share it with our folks. We need to be courageous in our proclamation. We need to be courageous in our purpose. We need to be courageous in our position. It didn't take a real long time for me to realize without a shadow of a doubt that God in heaven had called me to pastor Tabernacle Baptist Church. It didn't take me a long time to get that. So I know without being proud and boisterous and arrogant and ugly with it, God put me in this position. So I have God on my side in conducting his office when I conduct it according to his will and his way. Now, yes, I could be ugly and get out of the way and do things and browbeat you and all that other kind. I don't do that. I try to deliver what God places in my heart the way that I feel like God wants it delivered with the best of my ability that God has given me. And yes, I try to hone those skills and develop those skills and be the best I can for God. But God put me in this position. I don't mean it ugly. It ain't just the folks that voted me in. God put me here. And God has kept me here. And until the good Lord in heaven sees fit for me to be somewhere else, I want to be right here. Have no desire to leave or go anywhere else. I've talked to some of y'all in private. I've had all kinds of opportunities. I have no desire to go other places. All the discouragements, downfalls, and troubles, and heartaches, and gravesides that we've done here together, this is home. This is what God is, this is the position God put me in. So I ought to be able to stand in this position courageous with God helping me. When God puts you somewhere, when God leads you somewhere, when God gives you that opportunity, that, that, that place of service, then do it with courageous activity in your heart. Stand courageous. Little old David said, I ain't worried about your armor. I ain't worried about anybody else. I'm not worried about Goliath because I got God on my side. As a 17, 18 year old boy standing before a nine foot, six inch tall giant, David probably couldn't even hold up his shield. But he showed sure up, put him on the ground, didn't he? With courage from God. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the Lord's church. I can stand in the position that God's placed me in with courage that God is with me and God will help me complete the task. Amen. Be courage in your proclamation. When you stand and testify the goodness and the grace of God and God's word, it's his word. Be courageous in it. We don't have to act like we're about half scared of it. Be courageous. God Almighty is with us. Amen. And God will complete what he wants. We have a new creature. We need to be consistent in our church, in our character, in our charity. We need to be considerate of our obligations, our opportunities, and others. And we need to be, be courageous in our position and our purpose and our proclamation. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. One of the verses that the Lord... Uh, used in this, in this study that I was working on where he's talking about those disciples that they, they, they will be known for their love for one another. And John went on to write that we know that we have passed from death unto life because we have love for the brethren. Probably one of the greater verses used in, in assurance is that we know that we've got love for God's people. And that shows that we have a new creature in us because that old creature is all about self. That old creature is all about doing what he wants to do. Now, you can let him live if you want to, but God, God help you. You ain't supposed to be letting that flesh have rule and reign in your life. You ought to be letting the spirit work in your life, and that spirit work will cause you to love the brethren, love one another, others first. 
new creatures in Christ Jesus. See, it's strange when people see you give yourself for others. People look at our lives and see that we've dedicated. When I walked away from the sheriff's office, people that's in law enforcement that I've, I've met all over the country, when I preached in other churches, you know, they had, this is, he used to be a deputy, and they'd go through all that stuff. And, 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 and folks that knows anything about it says, you mean after 11 years you walked away? One chief of police down in Georgia told me, he said, usually, probably 9 out of 10, if they'll make that five-year mark, they retire. They don't ever leave. They retire out. You have to make them go home. Because if they make that five-year mark, it's in their blood. It's in their, and, and, and they're there. And you was 11 years and walked away? I said, yeah. The Lord changed my heart. The Lord done a work in me. I love others more than self. I gave up everything about Curtis that Curtis loved. Y'all hearing me? I'm not trying to brag. I'm just trying to show you God done a work in me. That new nature, that, that, that work of God worked in me drastically. I gave up the sheriff's office, gave up my canine work, gave up my four-wheeler, gave up my uh, uh, polished John Deere lawnmower. I waxed my lawnmower. When you drive Murray's and trash all your life, you finally get a John Deere, you'll polish that baby. I did. I'm telling you I did. And I wouldn't let my wife ride on it neither, <clears throat> drive it or anything else. I loved all those things. A home paid for. I gave it all up so that I could go forth and try to do what God had put in my heart for others. Christianity is about others. Amen? I'm a new nature. New creature in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'll take the thoughts tonight, have your will and your way in it. Lord, I pray, please, help us to be more like you. Help us to be developed into the Christian that you'd have us to be. Lord, we want to shine for you. We want to be that light in this dark world. Not that we get glory, but Lord, that we, we light up that cross. That our lives lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. In you being lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you. Dear Lord, please help us. Help us be better soul winners. God, please, in this, in this new year we're working in, Lord, we've just got a good start in it. Please help us reach souls for Jesus. Help us reach them so they don't die and go to a devil's hell. But, Father, the price that Christ paid for them on Calvary, let it not be in vain. Help us, each of us, to be better Christians. Help us, Lord, to reach the lost. And in that, Father, we'll give you the praise. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Let me remind you to keep praying for Brother Virgil. He's there in Iredale. I'm going to check on him in the morning, see if it's an opportunity to visit or not. I've got to make sure he's clean of the COVID. I'm not wanting to go up in there and get it on me. I've done had it, but I don't want to get it on me to where if I meet somebody else, I pass it. So I don't want to do that and contaminate myself. So help me remember that. Remember uh, the Todd Patterson family. I don't know when they was doing the service for that. Um, but do remember that. Miss Karen, some of her uh, folks are connected to that. So uh, pray for them. Uh, Miss Bree and them is connected some ways there. So uh, lift them up to the Lord in prayer. Remember Brother James Moore. He's not doing well. Uh, he was home Thursday or Friday, uh, but he's still not doing well. So keep Brother James Moore in your prayers. Yes, ma'am? Yes, uh, we was asked at lunch to pray for a, a Brother Steve Parker up in Alexander County, uh, Sulphur Springs Baptist Church, I believe. He's in Baptist. He's been through multiple surgeries, and he needs prayer. So remember, pray for him. Corey Leard. Tori. Oh, the young girl that was hurt in the accident. Remember her. She, she's still not doing too good. So please lift her up in prayer. They just done a, a good cake drive and, and was very blessed in that uh, to try to raise some funds to help with uh, that situation. 
I don't know how the insurance works on that. She was hurt on an ATV. Don't know whether it was homeowners helps in. I don't know how it works, but just pray about that um, because there's major bills to go with her situation. So pray for Miss Tory. All right. Anything else we need to mention? All right. Remember, remember uh, Lockley and the Walker family. All right. Lift up Judy's brother, Charlie Ray. He and his son, they need the Lord. Most and foremost, they need the Lord. And I, 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 I see some working going on there, so pray that uh, the Lord is able to humble his heart and he'll accept Christ. He'd been in more preaching than a lot of folks. He heard preaching all the way up until his high teens. So uh, good, solid gospel preaching. But just pray that God can use that to work in his heart and he'll humble himself and get saved before it's too late. Amen. Remember him. Anyone else? Pray about our church. Pray much God will work in it. Get us back where we need to be. I'm going to try to get some visiting going again here in the next uh, week or so and uh, see, see what we can do with that and reach some folks for Jesus. Amen. So pray, 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 pray. One of your obligations is to pray for me. So pray God will help me and, and bless me as we go forward to try to reach and help some folks. Amen. Anyone else? Unspoken, Miss Kay. Pray for Miss Kelly and her new procedures that's upcoming. Her MRI and stuff. Remember Miss Nikki, of course. Always we pray for Miss Nikki and Miss Anita. Yes, sir. Amen. Miss Jolene reported this morning that her daughter was doing better uh, from the COVID, so thank the Lord for touching and helping her daughter. And remember Miss Gail, she's got some upcoming work going on. They're doing some radiation and things with her, so please lift her up. And I spoke to someone today that's uh, got some things on their heart that really needs our prayers, so you lift those up. God knows what that is, um, but I spoke with a lady today that, that God, God uh, they need some prayer, so just lift that up. And remember uh, Miss Sue Johnson, God's touch and help with her and the decisions and things that's upcoming this week so um, that'd be that's EJ's brother so remember remember that whole family there yes ma'am yeah Kelly Beatty's going through a new process on her medications um, and in changing from the one type of medication to the new type of medication she's got to go several weeks with nothing and she has that RA, which is arthritis, so that's going to be extremely difficult and painful for her to deal with. So, please pray for her, pray for the children, pray for David, uh, that God will touch and 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 do a special work in her in these days. Please, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, remember Miss Mindy's baby, the young, young in there, that the Lord helping that. He's got some tests coming up, so pray for those tests. The Lord would help there. All right, am I missing somebody? Anything I'm missing? I missed who? Miss Donna goes back to the 17th. Pray all that goes well. I've got some appointments coming up uh, next few weeks, so pray that that all go well, too. Uh, they referred me to the Specialist on the kidney, I go get to meet your doctor. Uh, so I get to see him, see what he thinks about the situation I've got there. And then uh, the lung doctor I'm supposed to be meeting or talking with him this week. So pray all that goes well. Amen. Pray all heals up and gets cleaned out. No pneumonia, no bronchitis, but I still got some issues with the collapse. So pray that that clears up. Anyone else? I thought I seen a hand. Yes, ma'am. All right, pray for Miss Ann, seeing Dr. Boo. He's nice to her, y'all. Now, some of y'all, some of y'all, he ain't quite as nice with, but he's nice to her. Uh, but now, he chews me out when I was in the room, hallelujah. Brother Scott's got some, uh, it wasn't even my Pepsi. 
Brother Scott's got unspoken. Remember that. Remember our lost folk. Uh, we're still alive. I'll not mention all of those, but you know the lost folk connected with our families and the church. Pray hard about it. I want to see them saved now. Amen. I want to see them in church saved, serving Jesus. The greatest life in the world is to be a Christian. Amen. Everybody has ups and downs, but I got Jesus even in the ups and downs. Amen. It's amazing how you can smile in the middle of a mess. Brother Aaron Carrico's mother was dying last night. He knows she has died. And he posted the song, the lyrics to the song, When Peace Like a River. God in heaven sent peace across his soul, knowing his mother's fixing to cross over. She died at 1.30 this morning. We went to church with them in Kentucky twice a year for years and years and years. Years and years. We used to go to that Kentucky camp meeting, and, and uh, they good folks. We love them. We, we preached in camp meetings with them all over the country. Had good times. Lord's good. But pray for them. Miss Lou went on to be with the Lord this morning at 1.30. Anything else, anyone else before we pray and go? Our Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We want to thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for helping us today. Lord, you know my state this morning. and Lord, we just thank you for helping us through it, helping the singers. Thank you for the singing tonight. Lord, pray you bless them for their labor, their efforts, their time that they've given to you to, to study and, and to practice to be the best they can. God, please bless them greatly for their efforts. Lord, we pray that you'd meet these needs. There's been many requests lifted up tonight. You've heard each one, and I pray that God, in thy will, you'll move in each one. There's some folks, Lord, we've mentioned tonight in special request and unnamed request. That, Lord, they need a special touch from you. And I pray that, God, you'd give them just that. Give them that extra touch. Give them that extra uh, Holy Ghost hug, Lord. May they feel your presence. May they feel your power. May you overflood their soul with the joy of the Lord. Then for those, Lord, we know that are connected here to the church that are, that are lost and undone, Father, please save their soul before they die and go to a devil's hell. Lord, if you be willing, please touch us and help us to be soul winners. Help us to be better, Lord, in, in our labors and our efforts and our development that, God, as we go forward to try to reach souls for your sake, for their sake, Lord, please help us to be successful. God, you know that's the most fearful thing that I do is to try to win souls. I don't want to produce false professions. I don't want to bring about confusion. And, Lord, you know that I literally tremble in my boots with that situation. I pray that, God, you'd help us. Help us with it, that we might be successful for your sake and for their sake. Bless our little old church and grow it according to thy perfect will. And for all that you do, we honor you, we love you, and we thank you. And we give you praise in Jesus' precious name.